Hey everyone, my name is Corel, and today we're going to be taking a look at another tutorial video, the concepts of air movement. Uh, first off, I've got a uh, lovely little assistant jet here with which to demonstrate things. This is a fairly basic bomber. It's uh, got a bunch of bombs mounted in this center area that fly out when it uh, sees something below it, and those will just fly out and basically explode on a target. Uh, it's got a lot of different air components and movement mechanisms going on here, so that's why I chose this as my demonstration vehicle. Alright, so the first thing we're going to do is take a look at our air components. I'm going to move through these pretty quickly because there's a, not a lot of differences from the air to the water side of things. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of speed through these, tell you what the differences are, tell you what each of the components do, and we're going to kind of go through this pretty quickly because there's a lot of stuff here. Alright, so first on the list is jet engines. We've got, again, small engines here and huge engines. Worth noting, the max force on a small engine is 500. The max force on a huge engine is 4,500. Max power use down here is 20. Max power use down here is 180. So these are actually identical components for their volume. As compared to the water, where the large propellers were 20 times as effective as the small ones, um, the large ones are only 9 times as, large, as powerful as the small ones in the jet engines. And that's very important because it means that the only thing that you're getting out of this is extra health and size. Uh, you are not saving anything. These two components are functionally identical for the volume that you spend on them, uh, and for the resource cost that you spend on them, and for the power consumption. So really you have no incentive to go with the huge jet engines over the tiny ones. Uh, in fact, it can be greatly to your advantage to use the tiny ones because you can spread them out over the hull, which makes you a lot more resilient to damage. Now obviously if you're powering a huge vehicle, the huge engines, still a good thing. You kind of want to use those because you don't want to place 10 billion tiny jet engines. But uh, there's really no incentive directly to place the tiny one, or the large ones over the tiny ones. Alright, so in the ion thruster category, uh, again we have uh, just about the same thing going on here. Yeah, these are the large ones are exactly nine times as powerful as the small ones, nine times the cost nine times the power usage. Really the uh, ion engines are exactly, again we have the huge that are exactly nine times the previous one. Uh, so difference between ion engines and jet engines. As I noted in the water movement video, regular jet engines can provide force in one direction only. Uh, ion thrusters are the same. But regular jet engines cannot provide thrust when there is no atmosphere. Uh, so if you are underwater or if you're in space, a regular jet engine will give you no thrust, and as the atmosphere thins out as you get higher and higher in the atmosphere, uh, the jet engine will start producing less and less thrust because it needs that atmosphere in order to produce thrust. The ion thrusters do not have that problem. They can put out as much thrust as they want at any time they want. However, you'll notice that the max force that these can apply is 1350 and the max power use is 90. Up here in the jet engines, for the same size of component, we had 4,500 force for 80 power use. So that means our ion thrusters here are using half the power, but producing, oh, a little more than a quarter of the force. Call it a, call it, call it a third of the force. All right, so that's our jet engines and ion thrusters. The next component is custom jet engines. Custom jet engines are a little complex. Uh, you have to have a jet controller. This is kind of like a fuel engine. Uh, this jet controller is the controller for the engine. Uh, and this jet controller, if I shrink this down, this uh, vehicle actually has one of these, I've got my jet controller kind of in the center of the vehicle here. If I zoom all the way in here, you can see this is my jet controller in this vehicle. Now forward of that, I've got a bunch of compressors, and forward of those, I've got a bunch of air intakes, and behind the combustion, or the uh, controller, I've got combustion chambers. It's not necessarily a hard and fast rule. The uh, controller can be in front of some of these compressors or behind the combustion chambers. It really doesn't matter where in the line it is, as long as it is somewhere in this line. You can only build these engines in a straight line. Uh, so we've got the combustor and the uh, intakes and the compressor. 
The compressor uh, effectively compresses air that the intakes grab and pull in, and the compressors then uh, compress that air and send it backwards, and then these combustion chambers or combustors uh, mix that with fuel and burn it. So uh, the compressors, have, one thing I should add, on this right side over here, all of these are uh, add-ons that fit on the thing that they are next to. So in this case, I've got an intake. I've got an intake add-on that is a three by one construct that will fit on the top, left, right, or bottom of the intake, not on the front or back. And those will increase uh, the amount of air, in this case, that the intake is taking in. Also worth noting in the case of intakes, uh, you cannot stack multiple intakes like this unless you're willing to put extra air intake add-ons. The air intakes behind the first will have no effect unless they have air, air intake add-ons on them. All right, so going back here, we've got the compressors and they've got these extra compressor components on them. Those basically just increase the amount of compression that the compressors generate. Compressors uh, slightly increase fuel usage. Uh, they give a moderate thrust increase with a moderate increase in fuel usage, from the, as you can see from the, from the description there. The jet compressors um, increase the thrust output of the engine, but they uh, only take a little bit of fuel use. But what you can do is attach jet fuel injectors to them. These are kind of like the fuel injectors from a fuel engine. They have a large fuel consumption, but provide a large boost in power to the combustors that they're attached to. However, uh, these burn fuel inefficiently, so you want to avoid having too many of them. Uh, you end up trading space with the other components uh, for fuel efficiency when you use too many fuel injectors. So what I've got with this jet engine back here is I actually have six extra combustors on the sides and I've got six fuel injectors on the top and bottoms of these combustion chambers. The last thing you need is an exhaust and that goes on the back of the fuel engine. And if I take a look at the jet controller here, you can see this has the same propulsion editor that everything else uses. For the vast majority of cases, you're only ever going to use translational forward movement for this vehicle. All right, one thing I should note about the custom jets, uh, the custom jets consume fuel directly. They do not consume engine power. It doesn't matter how much engine power you're putting through on your vehicle, uh, the custom jet engines will not use it. They only consume fuel directly and they'll go through it usually at a very high rate. Uh, so you wanna be careful using these, especially in the campaign, you will burn through quite a lot of fuel, especially if you start tacking on the fuel injectors. Uh, just a word of warning there. You want to be careful with these. All right, so the next thing we're going to look at here is the wing segments. These provide upwards translational control authority, and that's really all they do. And it is a semi-fixed amount of control authority based on the speed of your vehicle. So they're always going to give you lift, essentially. They're always going to try and give you upwards directional thrust based on your forward speed. Now, that is kind of useful uh, for jets and aircraft. It's very much not useful if you're trying to produce, say, a six degree of freedom aircraft. So what you want to do with these is make sure that you're using them on the correct type of aircraft. You generally only want wings on some form of jet or airplane, not on thruster craft that are using six degree of freedom control. All right, so the next thing we have here is ailerons. Ailerons are basically a way of rolling your vehicle. They provide roll control authority, and you want to position them as far away from the center of mass to the left and right of your vehicle as you can. You can see I've got a bunch of ailerons out here on the tip of the wings, and I've spread them a little bit towards the back of the wing as well. Uh, that's partially just to try and keep them more in line with the center of mass, and partially to spread them out a little bit, so that if a cannon shell takes out one end of the wing, I don't lose all control. All right, so the next thing is the tailplane. Tailplanes are a little bit weird. These are a bi-directional yaw and pitch control mechanism. So if I put one of these down here and just take a look at it, uh, this is being used for yaw right, and it, I believe these can be used for pitch as well. Uh, if I turn the pitch up on that and check out the thrust indicators, 
actually not getting one out of this uh, tailplane, so uh, that's not terribly useful for me. Generally fairly useful, but I tend to prefer using aero elevators and aero rudders. The elevator is the elevation or pitch control portion of the tailplane, and the rudder is the yaw control authority uh, version of that. So I, as you can see here, I've actually got some of these uh, air rudders on the top and bottom. Reason for that is I'm centering those around my center of mass, so when I'm trying to yaw, I'm not getting any accidental roll control authority. And so the rudders are giving me the ability to yaw or turn my nose directly left and right. Uh, I also have aero elevators. These are actually mounted in this vehicle on the wings, in the back of the wings. And there's quite a few scattered all throughout the back of this particular wing. All right, the last one to look at is the universal flight surface. Uh, this is kind of a weird one. It's uh, automatically configured for every role it can fill based on its position, according to the uh, description. Uh, so that means if I put it back here, it's going to act as a uh, down control authority. That's a little odd. Um, that's very odd, in fact. Uh, so I don't think that's quite working the way it should. Um, yeah, that seems to be broken. But uh, what I would do with that is manually set that up to act as a pitch controller. If I turn it on its side and set up that way, I could set it to use a yaw rotational control authority. Uh, I would almost never use these for strafe. That just seems silly to me. Uh, along with the uh, translational uh, hover movement. That doesn't seem like a good idea to me. All right, so those are the main uh, air control surfaces. Those are all based on the speed that your vehicle is traveling. Only the wings out of these provide lift. So if you have too much or too little lift on the vehicle, try replacing some of your control surfaces with extra or fewer wings and uh, or replace wings with control surfaces for that matter if you have too much lift that is a thing you do want to be careful about not having too much lift and uh, that should pretty well take care of your jet needs just with this side of the vehicle area all right the next set of components we're going to look at is the helicopter stuff uh, first off we're going to take a look at the data blades these are a set of helicopter components that consist of a spinner a pole extender and extensions. Uh, to help demonstrate these, I've got this little uh, hovercraft tanky standoff gunship thing, and uh, this has a bunch of these on it. So we're going to take a look at the uh, basics of them first. You've got a spinner, and if I can zoom in here, I can demonstrate this. The spinner is the core of the uh, actual dead blade unit and you want one of those, and then you can have as many pole extenders on top of it as you like, as you can see from this uh, tilt rotor over here. And the spin block, or the spinner rather, will then just spin any uh, data blades attached to it. They don't have to be in any specific orientation, they just have to be spinning. So you can use mirror lines to build these things and they will work. So an interesting couple of things about these, uh, if you hit Q on them, you can set motor drive up and down. This will use engine power to drive the spinner in return for generating a huge amount of thrust compared to running without any motor drive whatsoever. You've also got this upwards force fraction here, but this basically dictates how much of this propeller do I want to always give lift straight up into the air. Uh, not straight up relative to the propeller blade, but straight up into the air. And I could orient this thing however I want to and still use that. So I could put this facing straight forwards on the nose of the vehicle and it would still give lift if I have that set to one. Uh, or if I have it set to anything less than one, only a percentage of that power will be used for the upwards direction force. Now you might have noticed that I did dead blades first instead of helicopter blades. That's because helicopter blades are a little more interesting. Uh, yeah, uh, these are a lot more complex to use in place. For the most part, I would recommend using data blades instead. But regular helicopter blades exist and work. 
but they're more complex to place, they're harder to get the forces working right, and generally speaking, they're just harder in every respect, and they are actually less useful than Deta Blades in the vast majority of cases. So I, while you can use helicopter blades, I would not recommend it. Um, again, it is there if you want it, and I'll show you how to build it. So you just need to take a regular spin block here, plop it up there, and what we're going to do is enter build mode on the spin block. Uh, on the spin block. On the spin block. There we go. Uh, we enter build mode on the spin block, and we cannot use mirror mode to build these. That will go horribly wrong. Usually what I like to do is use the unstabilized version. You can use the regular ones. The regular ones behave like the Deta Blades with the always upwards force turned all the way up. Uh, they are always provide a... Oh, sorry. These provide a force upwards relative to the blade on the placement of the vehicle. Now, if that doesn't make sense, that's because it doesn't really. Um, <laughs> what you get here is the direction that you place the helicopter blade indicates what force you're going to get out of the helicopter blade. So they provide a purely vertical up force when placed in a vertical orientation. Great, so if I put them like so, I'm going to get a vertical force out of them. Okay, great. And if I put them, say, on a spin block that is facing forwards, uh, let's go ahead and go back onto the hole and put one, say, out here on the nose, uh, just like so for demonstration purposes. The uh, helicopter blade, if I put this out here, will always give me pure forwards thrust. Now, it's going to do that regardless of which direction the vehicle is oriented. Uh, it's always going to give straight horizontal thrust uh, if, even if the vehicle is pointing or nosing down. And that makes it very difficult for the AI to control. So I would generally not recommend using these. If you do use them, I would recommend that you use the unstabilized version. These act almost exactly like the Deta Blades, and the AI is going to be a lot better at controlling them using the uh, spin rate control of the spin rate or the uh, spinner block there. Uh, again, here we also have the motor drive, and there's a few other options that we have here. I would set this to continuous mode just so that it uh, works as a continuous propeller. Back to our first vehicle for the remaining components, we've got a helium pump here. The helium pump uh, is very similar to the air pump from the water tab, and it has a lot of the same benefits and drawbacks. It uh, Basically, you put it in an empty space, like I've got a little bit of empty space in the middle of this vehicle here, and I slapped a chair down in there. I could put a helium pump in here, and it would provide upwards lift because helium is lighter than air. So it's basically filling that cavity out and giving me vertical lift in that space. Uh, also, since I am a robot, it doesn't matter if I breathe helium. I'm not even going to get a funny voice out of it, unfortunately. Anyway, uh, so the helium pump uh, has a couple of drawbacks from the water pump style of, uh, or the air pump rather, a style of enclosed volume control, lift control, if you want to call it that. Uh, the helium pump is uh, very limited is as far as breaches in its space. If there are any breaches, including, uh, say, a turret, in the space that it is trying to control, the helium pump will do absolutely nothing. It's not going to be like an air pump where uh, it can exert a little bit of lift if it's only given uh, a wide open gapped area. It's not going to give you any upwards uh, lift if you are dealing with, uh, or like if there was a wave lapping over the top of a ship, the air pump could still help you out there because it's uh, pumping that water out as it comes in. No, the helium pump uh, fills an enclosed space with helium. If there are any breaches in that space whatsoever, if there's any way to open air, that helium is gone and it will not exist. The lift you are getting goes away instantly and that makes the helium pump a very fragile and dangerous component to use because if you use that and any space gets breached, 
uh, then you immediately lose the lift in that space. And that tends to have a compounding effect where suddenly you're lower to the ground, you're not able to move as well, you're getting uh, within range of more weaponry, and it just creates this compounding effect of uh, falling out of the sky and getting shot more and falling out more further. And yeah, it's uh, generally not my favorite component in the world. Uh, one that really is handy, though, in a lot of cases, or was more up until PIDs became a thing, is the jet stabilizer. Now, jet stabilizers use a little bit of engine power, not much at all, and what they do is they stabilize the flight of a vehicle. And uh, they're going to attempt to do so regardless of whether that flight should be stabilized or not. That's very important to note because the jet stabilizers are... Yeah, not my favorite component in the world either. Um, essentially what they're going to do is if I am on the left side of the vehicle, or the right side of the vehicle in this case, uh, if I attach some jet stabilizers out here, these are going to attempt to keep my roll perfectly level. That's all they're going to do. That roll is going to stay level if these jet, uh, or if these uh, stabilizers have anything to say about it. So if I need to roll to turn, these are going to fight me hard. And that's not what I want. So I don't like these very much. Um, they don't really have any control options on them. And yeah, they tend to get in the way as much as they help. Uh, however, if you do have a vehicle that is supposed to remain perfectly steady in the pitch and or roll directions, these can be used to help with that, uh, even without the uh, ability to provide enough control authority in those directions. Uh, they are very good at rotational balancing. So in this case, um, this vehicle isn't needing to yaw or roll rather to turn right now, and these are keeping it from doing so anyway. But if I take those off, uh, it will be able to roll to turn much more effectively, and I'm going to be better off uh, with this particular style of jet. Now, uh, one thing to note about these, uh, the backs of them, this flat spot, you always want that pointing towards the center of mass. So it doesn't matter if I'm all the way up here or not, uh, if these are all the way up here in the front, I want them pointing in towards the center of mass if I want them giving roll control authority. If I want them providing pitch control authority, they need to be up here. Uh, they need to be on the nose and they need to be facing towards the center of mass. Uh, they only, or the amount of control authority that they give you is based on the distance from center of mass as with all thrust mechanisms. But since these are very uncontrollable, uh, they don't really have any control UI or anything, the way you control them and tell them whether they're supposed to be used for roll or pitch is by their orientation. So what that means is if I come over here to this side of the wing and I was to put one of these over here, it's going to intentionally try and destabilize the vehicle. That's not what you want. Uh, that, that is not a good thing. If I had more of these out here than my rotational or roll control authority could overcome, then this vehicle would get completely flipped over and it just would not be good at all. So be careful how you place these. Always keep the center towards the uh, center of mass or the flat face towards the center of mass, I should say. All right, the last component we're going to discuss is the hot air balloon deployer. And these uh, are useful mostly for getting jets out of the water. In the case of this particular vehicle, I haven't used any because if it goes into the water, there's other problems going on and it's not going to be able to fly when it does get out of the water. But overall, for general uh, lift uh, and helping you get out of the water with a small jet, these can be quite useful. So more or less what these do is they deploy a balloon. If I pop them down there and put down a switch that lets me control them, and this can also be controlled by the AI, if I hit Q here, it's going to deploy balloons. And those balloons are going to give me a fair amount of lift. Again, with the uh, lift indicators, I'm not exactly getting indicators out of the balloons, but those are providing a fair amount of lift upwards. Uh, now, if I was to shoot this vehicle, those balloons, if they get hit by any sort of projectile, are going to break and fly away. And that makes balloons not great as a primary lift mechanism, because if you're getting, if you're losing lift as you're getting shot, then you are automatically 
at a disadvantage in terms of uh, keeping yourself away from harm. If you get your balloon shot off, you're going to get lower. Things that get lower tend to get hit by more weaponry, so you're putting yourself at an intentional disadvantage by using these for lift. Because you know you're going to take shots. Uh, the balloons are too large, they're too bulky, they're above the vehicle. So if you think about APS rounds and anything with a projectile arc to it, it's going to come in from the top of your vehicle, most likely. And that's going to intersect with those balloons, it's going to hit the balloons, it's going to pop them and deflect them away from your aircraft, and you're not really going to get a whole lot of lift out of those when they're floating up in the sky and you're falling back down towards the ocean. So uh, I tend not to like those as a primary lift propulsion mechanism, but uh, they're excellent if you just need to get the nose of a jet out of the water uh, so that it can uh, return to the skies after getting repaired. Uh, I tend to use those a lot in campaign as a temporary mechanism just to get something flying again if it's been knocked down into the water. Alright, so that's it for our components. Everything else over here is a land component, so let's go ahead and start talking about the various different movement mechanisms. I've shown you two vehicles here. There's this guy and there's the uh, helicopter. A jet, when you're talking about how a jet moves, uh, you almost always need forward thrust, or really, rather, you always need forward thrust. And generally, jets don't stop in midair and reverse. That's because their lift is dependent on wings, which is dependent, and the lift wings provide is dependent on your forward speed. So jets have an incentive to go as fast as possible, for a lot of reasons, really. Speed is life in From the Depths. If you aren't moving and you aren't moving quickly, you're going to get hit a lot more often. This particular bomber here is very nearly immune to conventional cannon fire. And to demonstrate that here, I'm going to load in, uh, let's go into uh, an Onyx Watch ship. Uh, let's get a uh, something that's going to not die instantly here. The Bastion here is not even in the same weight class as this bomber, but it's enough for demonstration purposes. Uh, the Bastion here is going to fire away with cram cannons. Those are slow shells, but uh, they'll get the point across here. They're not going to even get remotely close to hitting this thing because of its speed and because of how it turns and moves. Uh, so speed can keep you out of harm's way and get you into a lot better position to drop weaponry on your targets. And I don't think that that thing is even going to get a second volley off. Uh, anyway, yeah, ouch. So that is pretty much what you want to get for jets. You want to go as fast as possible. Now that will have some interesting repercussions as far as wings, because wings are going to provide you lift based on your forward speed. If you have a fast jet, you almost always need fewer wings than you think you do. And having too many can actually be just as bad as having too few. If you have too few, you're not going to be able to lift yourself out of the uh, water. Well, you're not going to be able to provide enough lift to keep yourself out of the water at all. And if you have too much lift, you're constantly going to have to be nosing down and using control authority to try and fight against the lift that your vehicle is producing. So both too little and too much are a bad thing. Uh, there's a Goldilocks zone there that is really down to the individual vehicle. It's down to the wing placement on the vehicle. It's down to how heavy the vehicle is. It's down to how fast the vehicle is and the drag and the thrust and all of that stuff factors into that. So really it's done on a per vehicle basis. The best advice I can give you there is if you are nosing down, uh, like say you have a PID on there that's set up to control the pitch, and you notice your vehicle consistently nosing down, you have too much lift, you need to remove some in order to uh, get your vehicle back under control. Now, uh, one thing that is good to note here, I'm gonna actually lock this vehicle in place, so this is easier to notice. The mass indicator here is slightly in front of the lift indicator. Now, I haven't really talked about lift indicators, but those indicate where the center of lift in the vehicle is. So if I have wings on this vehicle, that's telling me where the center of that lift is, where exactly I am providing up force from, essentially, uh, is more or less what that boils down to. Um, the 
center of mass is in front of this. And that's usually a good thing. Uh, what you generally want is a very slight difference between your center of lift and your center of mass. So why does the center of lift need to be behind the center of mass? Well, that's actually fairly important because it means that you are providing upwards translational control authority behind the center of mass, which is automatically going to give you nose down uh, kind of uh, push as you're traveling forwards and gaining that lift. Well, why does that matter? Why would we want to be pitching down? Well, From the Depths AI has a nasty little tendency of not controlling its upwards and downwards nose very well. It will generally be very good, in fact excellent, at trying to oversteer upwards, not so great about steering downwards. So if you're not careful with your vehicle, it will try and fly off into space. And usually it will succeed, and it will get so high up there that it's out of atmosphere and it's out of gravity, and it's just going to kind of float around up there. It can't really do anything. It can't maneuver. It doesn't have thrust up there. It really can't do anything at that point, and it's just kind of helpless out there in space. So uh, having your center of lift behind your center of mass ensures that you always have a little bit of pitch down going on that the AI has to fight against and the PID has to fight against just a little bit. And having that little bit of a fight there uh, ensures that over time you'll nose down until you get to such point as the AI tells you to nose up. That gives you a little bit of vertical wobble as well, which means that uh, your aircraft is going to be traveling up and down slightly as it travels forward. And that is a good thing because that keeps you out of the line of fire of cannons who would otherwise be able to predict your movement very precisely. So a little bit of a double-edged uh, sword there in a positive sense because we're getting essentially evasion and we are getting the ability to not become a spacecraft out of the same uh, concept. Now you don't want the center of lift way behind the center of mass uh, because otherwise your uh, pitch up control authority becomes less effective and the further behind it is the less and less the pitch up control authority is going to be useful. But you do want your lift slightly behind the center of mass in most cases for jets. Alright, so the advantages and disadvantages of jets, as I've noted, they're very fast, they're very evasive, and uh, generally they're very good for bombers because they're going to fly over the target or they're going to get close enough to the target to drop bombs that can then be guided in. And it's really a pretty good thing. I mean, you're getting a very fast evasive vehicle with a lot of oomph. Uh, you don't have to worry about keeping weapons const constantly on target because you're going to have a chance to turn away and reload the weapons. Missiles are a very good option for jets. Uh, you don't really need to worry so much about the reload time of missiles if you're facing away from the enemy anyway until they've already reloaded. So uh, very good for bombers, very good for anything using missiles as a primary armament, and just generally uh, an evasive vehicle that's hard to hit hard to uh, destroy while still being very effective. Alright, so some other things about jets. I am a huge fan, well, in aerial vehicles in general, I am a huge fan of tilt rotors of some variety. You'll notice that I've, and tilt rotors in this case being tilt jets, but, or tilt ion engines? Yeah, you get the idea. Uh, these provide thrust, they provide control authority in the um, roll and yeah, to some degree in the lift directions. If I take a look at my spin block here, uh, you'll note on the angle control actually, I've got pitch down and roll right control in there. And that will more or less allow these to act as a pitch mechanism, because if you tilt them up, these are fairly well in line with the center of mass. They're providing downwards translational control authority, or upwards translational rather, because they're facing downwards. So uh, if you tilt both of these up at the same time, they actually lift the vehicle into the air. That's useful occasionally. Um, they're also providing roll control authority because if you turn one down and the other up then that uh, gives you a little bit of a roll and I haven't really talked about that movement mechanism yet. Um, I'll probably get into that more later when building one or a standoff vehicle but uh, yeah if you tilt a thruster up and another one down on the opposite side of the vehicle you actually get roll, 
if you're facing forwards with the jet. If you're facing upwards with them, like if these were uh, pointed straight up, uh, I would actually get yaw control authority out of that. So a uh, very useful interaction there that we can use in all sorts of interesting ways when we start talking about uh, tilt thrust aircraft. Uh, this vehicle, as you know, also has ion engines out here. Generally, I like some ion engines, even on a pure jet vehicle. And in this case, since they're giving me forward tra forwards translational control authority, roll control authority, and a pitch control authority, these are enough to make sure that I can get back down out of space if I was ever to get damaged and fly up into space. As long as these two pods remain operational or can be repaired, I will eventually be able to make it down from space back into the atmosphere where my jet can take over, or my custom jet engine rather. So those are very useful additions to the vehicle. All right, so I've talked a lot about jets and not so much about six axis movement. Now, uh, six axis movement is very good for uh, standoff gunships. And I'm a huge fan of standoff gunships. If you're using advanced cannons or any sort of laser weaponry or anything that has to remain on target for a long time, a standoff gunship is an excellent tool. So for instance, if I turn the AI of these vehicles off and looks like my uh, standoff gunship out there is flown off into space, but uh, let's just go ahead and spawn in a new one over here. So uh, what this vehicle is going to try and do is stay at a set distance from the bastion and just try and pester it from range. Uh, it's got forwards facing cannons, it's got forwards facing missile racks. I don't need to worry about the orientation of the weapons because I know this vehicle is going to stay facing towards that target at all times. I know it's going to stay facing there, I know it's going to stay at approximately a set range, so I don't have to worry about missile range or cannon range so much. I can fine tune my weaponry for a specific angle and range and have that weaponry generally be much more effective over time. Now, uh, I've used this with advanced cannons and missiles. This goes also well with uh, other mechanisms like lasers, particle cannons especially since they're big and bulky and hard to turret. Uh, anything like that is a very good candidate for a standoff gunship type air movement. And that has to be almost by definition six axis movement. Uh, this vehicle has six axis movement because it has strafe, uh, lift, forwards and backwards thrust, and all three rotational control axes. When you're talking about uh, air movement in general, you have to have all three rotational control axes. The uh, uh, jet only needs forwards and upwards translational. It does not need strafe. A true six axis movement needs all three translational. But in the case of this vehicle, you can technically get away without the full six axis. You can get away without the strafe axis. I tend to like to include it because it means that your strafe can be used to help evade missiles. Uh, essentially, the more directions you can accelerate at once, the better your chances of evading a hostile missile. So uh, that's kind of the strengths of this type of vehicle. Also, uh, when shielding and armoring it, you can stack armor towards the front of the vehicle, you can stack shields towards the front of the vehicle, and you can be reasonably sure that the front is going to be pointed towards the enemy. Uh, so that's why I would generally use a six axis type of movement. Uh, another trick here you can use with these, differential thrust is excellent with a six axis movement. If you remember when you were talking about the boats and using differential thrust on those with propellers, I mentioned that it's not a great idea because if one of your rear thrusters gets destroyed, that removes your yaw control authority. Well, generally in a jet, there's plenty of spaces where you can pack in some additional yaw control authority. So in this case, I've got yaw control authority on all four of these tilt rotors. So if any one of those gets blown up, I've still got three more that are providing yaw control authority. Uh, likewise, with the um, uh, forwards back, if any of these get destroyed, I can still go forwards and backwards because I've still got three others. Uh, so tilt rotors are very useful for this style of vehicle, and uh, therefore I can use differential thrust. So if I have a thruster up here, and in fact just to demonstrate this, if I have a thruster up here on one side of the vehicle, and this is going to look horribly ugly, but... 
bear with me here. Uh, if I use this jet engine over here, I can use this for forwards travel. I can also use this for yaw. And if I use this for yaw, on both of these, I've got differential thrust. Well, since these are at the back of the vehicle, and any cannon fire coming through has to go through the front of the vehicle because this is almost always turned to face its target, uh, that makes that differential thrust a lot safer than a boat, which has only two axes to maneuver in, and therefore is almost certainly going to take some sort of fire to the rear at some point. So um, these can be a good scenario for that differential thrust movement. Uh, another technique you'll note that I've used here is I have six rotors and I've got some jets on here too. And in fact, there's a few more rotors scattered around the vehicle. There's even one or two internally. Uh, those are all providing damage resilience because if any one of these gets blown off, I still have perfect control over this vehicle. So this is a very controllable, very stable vehicle that's hard to shoot down because you have to remove so many parts of its uh, control mechanisms before it actually starts falling out of the sky. Now in this specific case, this vehicle is too heavy, and that's its main weakness. If you start removing too much lift off of it, it's just start going to start falling out of the sky. There's not nearly enough vertical control authority on this. In order to counter that, what I would normally do is spread a few more jets pointing vertically, uh, below the center of mass here, or evenly spaced around the center of mass up here using maybe some small jet engines on the sides. And uh, that would give me a lot more vertical control authority that would let me use these side rotors here a lot more for tilt, uh, or in their tilt configurations for um, yaw control authority and for um, roll. Basically, if I remove some of the lift uh, need from those, I have a lot more power to work with for everything else. And so if I was to make an improvement to this vehicle, that's what I would do. I would likely line this corner back here with a bunch of jets. So yeah, say like something like that. And now you can see those tilt rotors have slowed down a lot. They're having to work a lot less hard to provide lift and therefore they're a lot more capable of uh, spe spinning, Blah. I can't talk today. Therefore they're a lot more capable of speeding up and spinning faster in order to provide roll and yaw and uh, pitch and all that good stuff. All right, so that's everything I've got for air movement. Next up we're gonna take a quick look at land movement and after that video we're gonna start getting into PID and AI configurations and how you set all these crazy things up to actually be controlled. And uh, that will be a very interesting and deep topic. I might end up doing some more videos on those, uh, splitting that up into multiples, because I suspect we're going to be spending quite a bit of time on that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed, and uh, see you in the next one. Thanks.